Thank you, Alicia. This has been a lot of fun. Um, this has been a fun topic to research. This has been a fun topic uh, to put together. And I hope you have as much fun um, as I have had in putting this together. I am uh, Cindy Haynes. I am a professor in the Department of Horticulture at Iowa State University. Um, and I love plants and I love everything about plants. And a couple of years ago, before the pandemic, I did a little research on what some plants were that had some spooky names um, that really weren't that scary or that spooky, but had some unusual names and I wondered why. And that kind of started this path, uh, started me down this path and thinking about what plants are spooky and which ones are not so spooky as well. So if this will work, there we go. Um, so what makes a plant scary or spooky? Um, this is what makes a plant scary or spooky by my definition. Do realize that this might be a little subjective for you as well, but I've broken it into four big categories. Those plants uh, like Bleeding Heart that are just unfortunate have a spooky or scary name. Um, they're really good plants and there's really not that much spooky or scary about them. There's also a category that looks kind of scary. Um, these are Frankenstein cactuses where two different cactuses are put together. Um, they may look a little weird or a little strange, uh, but they're generally nice plants uh, to have. And then there are some plants that look good, um, but they can be a little scary in the landscape and they can maybe take over or maybe have some naughty behaviors uh, in the landscape. Sometimes that means they're aggressive. Sometimes that means they're just a little strange um, or do something a little different. And then the final category that I have is those plants that we really do need to be aware of, um, that maybe we need to stay away from, but certainly to, uh, plants that we don't want to um, ingest or eat um, because they may have some kind of toxic effects. This is a um, and the lower right corner is a, a holly that I grew up with uh, called Yopan holly. Um, and the scientific name is Ilex vomitoria. So guess what this one will do to you if you eat those little red berries. So here we go. So the four categories are the, those plants that are spooky in name only, um, that really don't have anything that's too bad about them. There are the scary looking plants as well, those with naughty behaviors, and those with some toxic defenses uh, that we'll talk about, and maybe some bad consequences uh, for us. With each of these, as we kind of go through them, I'll point out the ones that we can grow in Iowa, um, I'll point out the ones that maybe don't grow so well in Iowa or the ones that might be a house plant like this Dracula orchid on the right. My first group are those that are in name only scary. And that's a lot of plants that have spider or bat or blood um, in the name. These are really not that spooky plants. They're actually a long list of very good plants that you might consider uh, for your home or your landscape. Uh, something like bat flower or bleeding heart. Bat flower is going to be a house plant. Bleeding heart's a great perennial. You saw it on the second slide. Dracula orchid, you just saw as well. And a few others that have some unfortunate names like eyeball plant or snake plant um, or spider plant even witch hazel, or one that maybe you've heard of is called zombie palm. Let me show you what some of these look like. Um, this is a ghost plant in the upper left uh, corner of the screen. This is a fungus kind of that grows, um, that appears sometimes in woods. And this one was taken in Iowa. It's pretty rare to see this one um, and it's pure white. Uh, so it's very unusual to see something that looks this white. Um, so it's a lot like a ghost because of it. Uh, very cool to see and usually doesn't do any damage or any harm. So if you see this one, photograph it because it's a pretty rare sight uh, to actually see. The one right next to it 
um, that looks a little bit like an eyeball. It's called an eyeball plant. This is an annual in Iowa. Um, it's a daisy that doesn't have any petals in a sense. So you just have that kind of hard, uh, tiny little flowers in the center. This one's also called toothache plant because when you eat on these flower buds, okay, or these flowers, it will numb your mouth for a few minutes um, and it can be used kind of as a medicinal, um, as a toothache plant. So very interesting annual plant that we sometimes grow outdoors in containers or beds and borders. Below it are two other plants that are pretty common. Uh, witch hazel is on the lower right corner. Um, this is a, a small tree or a large shrub. Um, there are witch hazels that bloom in the fall. So this one was blooming just this past week at Ryman Gardens. It's a fall blooming witch hazel. And then there are some that bloom in the spring as well. Witch hazel sometimes used in uh, lotions and potions as well. Um, because it has a nice kind of calming effect um, in, in lotions. That's one of the reasons why it's used. And then spider plant is also called airplane plant. Um, it's a fun one to have in your house. It's a great house plant um, because it's so easy to grow. And it's called spider plant because it produces these offshoots, these little daughter plants off to the side that look a lot like spider legs kind of as it's coming off. Um, pretty easy one uh, to grow indoors. This big picture is a Dracula orchid. Um, I took this picture in Ecuador where they have a lot of beautiful orchids um, and it's sometimes called vampire orchid as well and it's usually in different colors but this one was a black one and it was pretty beautiful. They're pretty rare they're not the easiest orchids to grow and you don't see it very often so when you do see it take a picture. And then there's a bat flower in the upper right. This is another fairly decent house plant if you have a big enough place and a big enough kind of uh, container for it. This would be a tropical plant you would see at a conservatory, a lot like some of those orchids. Um, and it's a really fun one because the, the petals look a lot like bat wings. There are a few others that we could consider in the spooky name category. Some people consider naked ladies kind of scary. So uh, naked lady is a bulb that blooms without foliage and it's in the upper uh, left-hand corner, always pink and a great bulb to purchase now for you to plant for having blooms next year. Uh, spider plant is in the center on the top. This is a, an annual plant that reseeds um, and it's called spider plants because the stamens extend beyond the uh, petals, a lot like spider legs. And then gas plant is the other pink one on the top. Um, it's called gas plant because it emits this volatile gas, in a sense, um, around the flower as the flowers are starting to open. And on a really still, warm night, um, you can go out and uh, strike a match and it'll burst into flame just for a second but it'll burst into flame so it is a it is a flammable uh, gas which is kind of interesting um, it's a beautiful perennial uh, hard to find um, but well worth growing and finding and we're so windy in Iowa I don't think we have to worry so much about it bursting into flame in the landscape the three on the bottom are houseplants or tropical plants. Um, the one on the left is called the zombie palm and it's called the zombie palm because it looks like the the stems are wrapped in burlap with these kind of cactus uh, thorns kind of coming out of it. It's also called um, Haiti uh, cacti palm or cactus palm because it is from Haiti um, and has these kind of thorny um, spines along the trunk. In the center is snake plant. Um, there are lots of different types of snake plant that make fantastic houseplants. Uh, this is a short one. Sometimes they have leaves that have more patterns like a snake. Um, an easy one to grow that everyone should have uh, indoors. So invest in a different type or a type of snake plant. And then finally, uh, the one on the lower right is Monstera. Um, it's kind of fun to have an, a plant named after a monster. And this is a big houseplant. 
Um, it's got fairly large leaves. It gets fairly large in the space, especially when it's happy. And it's got these holes in the leaves that make it a lot of fun, a lot of fun uh, to play with. Um, and a lot of fun to have as long as you have enough light. Um, it's not the easiest house plant to grow if you don't have a, some really good light. There's some other plants out there too that have uh, spooky names. And this is where I'm gonna ask you to, to type into the chat. Is the chat working now? Ah, yes. So the chat is working, which is fantastic. So if you have some other plants that are have spooky or scary names that aren't so spooky or scary, type those into the chat. My other example, my other picture is bloodroot. Um, this is a wonderful uh, woodland native wildflower um, that gets in its name because the root, the sap, especially in the base of the leaves and the root, is kind of bloody. So, yep. We'll get to voodoo lily. Um, mo Mother-in-law's tongue is another name for snake plant, so you got that one. Ooh, spiderwort's a good one I forgot. Ooh, I don't know, nuts, wamaka. I don't know, Kent, I'll have to look that one up. Ghost fern, I have that one in my landscape. It's a nice one. Oh, strychnine tree. You came up, you're coming up with some good ones. Longwort's another one um, that is a good one in, uh, a good perennial in the landscape. It's not on my list and it should have been. So, and yes, Annabelle will get to Devil's Claw in a little bit. Other ones, ah, uh, we'll get to Venus Flytrap too. It doesn't hit this category. Ooh, Rattlesnake Master, great one, Nathan. I love that one. That one should be in here um, as well. So good job, everyone. Um, some of these we're gonna get to, um, and some of them uh, you'll see in just a little bit. Yes, and Wolfsbane's coming right up. Let me start with the next group. The next group are the scary looking plants. These are the ones that um, have some sort of feature that is a little bit strange or a little bit scary. Um, and there's some fun ones that I looked up here. And so you see Devil's Claw is on the list here because it looks a little bit scary. Um, that Frankenstein cactus that you saw earlier, um, even some other things like honey locust, uh, which is our, a normal one for us to see walking in the woods. Let me show you what some of those look like. Um, in the center here is that Frankenstein cactus again. Um, this was in a greenhouse in Louisiana, and it was not scary at all to this little lizard, um, but it did kind of freak me out when I saw the Frankenstein cactus and the lizard uh, moving around on it um, as well. Kind of cool. Made for a nice shot. He sat still long enough. On the upper left, you'll see um, a brain type flower. This is coxcomb or celosia. Um, and there are lots of different celosia or coxcomb that have that kind of brain type flower that's really amazing as a cut flower and as amazing as a dried flower. This is an annual that we grow outdoors um, in the spring and summer um, and is a fantastic uh, flower used in bouquets um, for all, all uh, the different seasons. Lots of colors uh, for celosia or coxcomb. Below it's another brain type plant or brain looking plant. This one's a little scarier because it's a cactus. This is a mammillaria. Um, so this is a type of brain cactus that kind of grows in these kind of distorted or elongated or contorted um, ways. And there are thorns there as well. But it's a fun house plant to have once again, if you have plenty of light. And then the final one is the one in the upper right that is something called doll's eyes. And this one's really creepy um, to me when it's in fruit. Um, it's a great white flower on an actea, which is a wonderful perennial, a shade loving perennial. Um, looks great um, until it produces this white fruit with a little black pupil um, in it. And these hang around for about a month usually sometime in September and into October. So timing is perfect uh, to be a little bit scary as well. 
a few others uh, that are in the strange and scary looking um, are this bat face kufia, uh, which is a, a fun one to actually have as an annual, uh, maybe even a houseplant, but an annual in containers outside. The second one from the left is that honey locust. Um, the thorns on the honey locusts that grow in the woods are amazing. Um, they're usually three pronged. That's what triocanthos means is three pronged and they come out of the stems and the, the trunk and the barks um, all over the place. Um, so it, it's pretty vicious and very protective um, of the trunk and the bark on this particular tree. Fortunately for us, there's a thornless type of honey locust that we put in our landscapes that aren't quite as deadly. There's some other weird woody shrubs out there as well. This is called Harry Lauder's walking stick. It's a type of Coriolis um, or filbert, related to a filbert, and it has very contorted um, stems and trunk, and it's just really very interesting to see in the landscape. Um, a very unique small uh, tree, large shrub um, in the landscape, and does pretty well in Iowa. And then the last two on the right are fungi or slime molds, and they kind of creep me out. I must admit that this second one, the red one, is something called bleeding teeth, um, and it just makes my teeth hurt uh, thinking about it. Uh, and the last one is a slime mold, sometimes called dog vomit. Um, so it's another one that isn't so easy. Some of these slime molds and some of these fungi appear in um, mulches. So we do see them occasionally in the Midwest and throughout um, the U.S. The last two that I will show that are scary looking, that, um, but really are kind of fun to think about, is this Naringella. Um, are a member of the potato tomato family um, that has these vicious thorns on the leaves and actually produces a pretty cool um, orange type fruit. Um, this one grows well in containers and sometimes can be used as an annual in containers, but this is what you get. So you have to like the kind of thorny appearance uh, to think about it. And then the one on the right is a very interesting, interesting one. This is a bit more of a weed the one called Devil's Claw, um, an interesting plant that produces this pod with these kind of two uh, claw-like appendages on, on the end of the pod. Uh, it's a, This is a, a seed capsule, so this one becomes somewhat weedy in the area. And I would say 10 years ago, we, we rarely saw this one um, in Iowa. Now we're seeing it just a little bit more. And I think this picture came from someone in Southeast Iowa who sent it here to horticulture. So kind of cool uh, to think about that. And now's also the time that I ask you, is there any other scary looking plants that you would uh, consider or that should be added to my list? Oh, hedge apples, those are good ones. Hedge apples, I didn't think about that one, I should have. Ooh, Dead Man's Fingers, another good one. Mm-hmm. I don't know, Peanut Pumpkin. I'll have to look that one up. Uh, Madagascar Palm. There are a lot of palms that are a little bit strange, I would agree. I should have gotten hedge apples, though. Oh, and then the eggplant, um, that pumpkin on a stick, which is actually an eggplant, I think. So pretty cool. You guys are good. Oh, and bittersweet and green briar. Yeah, green briar is another one. Um, I think it was on the list. I don't think I showed you a picture of um, that is kind of thorny. Um, and bittersweet is a little bit unusual looking as well. Good job. I like this. I like this group. So let's move on to the next group of plants. These are the ones that are a little bit more naughty. Um, they have some naughty behaviors. They don't do everything um, exactly the way we want them to. Um, there are some fun fungi on this list. There are some other weeds on this list. Um, this is the list that includes most of those carnivorous plants as well. And that's because these carnivorous plants not only just look pretty in their landscape, they actually attack things or, or um, 
eat different insects as well. Uh, some of the things that are on this list too attack um, or outcompete other plants in their neighborhood as well. So they become some of the invasive plants that are on this list too. And you'll see some of these that you have seen before. Excellent. So the first uh, three up are the carnivorous plants. Bladderwort is also another one that would be on this list. But the pitcher plants, this is a tropical pitcher plant, which actually makes a pretty good house plant if you have a nice humid um, home where you're getting some bright light. Um, there's also another pitcher plant that is native to parts of the southeast, like North and South Carolina, that grows pretty well in a, like an aquarium type setting, so a boggy type conditions. In the center is Venus flytrap. Um, this is such a fun one to have as a houseplant. It's not an easy houseplant to grow, um, but it's a fun one to have even if you only have for a short time. Um, I tell my students that uh, Venus flytrap, um, the traps close because two out of the three out of the four hairs um, are triggered by some sort of insect that moves in them, and then it closes within almost a second, um, and then we'll start to digest whatever's in it, or attempt to digest whatever's in it. So you can put even little dead flies and move it around in there and get it to close um, and feed it as well. Both of these plants come from areas which are fairly infertile, um, so the digestion of these insects is a way to kind of add some fertility or nutrients uh, to their diet. Uh, it's also interesting that all three of these plants, even sundew with a little bee that's trapped in it, um, produce beautiful flowers that attract pollinators and then they let them go. So it's not um, like every part of the plant is always out to get the insects. There are some other naughty plants um, that I call naughty because they generally produce seeds, um, seeds that get everywhere. Um, whether it's invasive plants like the garlic mustard, which is on the lower left, um, or potentially invasive plants like barberry, when the birds eat the seeds and take them somewhere else, um, or the two plants in the center, which are perennial or annuals that may spread in certain areas and may not be an issue in others. The lower one is Japanese bloodgrass that spreads by root systems and sometimes reseeds as well, making it an invasive and illegal plant to actually sell in Iowa. The one on top is a fun one. Uh, this is something called touch me not um, or rose balsam. It's an old type of impatience, um, kind of an heirloom impatience. And it's a fun one to have because when you touch the seed pods, when they're ripe enough, they project it out. It explodes and it sends those seed flying 20 or 30 feet uh, sometimes. So it is a plant that will reseed a lot in your garden, but it's usually not one that's impossible uh, to control because not all of the seed actually germinate. Now, if I could control this one, the big one, this is a stick tight um, that gets all over my pants legs when I'm walking in the woods or my dog's fur uh, when we're walking through the woods, especially this time of year. Um, this is, it Velcros itself to the uh, dog's fur and becomes really knotted and really, really hard uh, to get out. So it's a very good seed dispersal mechanism. Then there are also some fungi and parasitic plants that are also on this list. Uh, they're a little um, interesting. They produce some interesting smells. The one on the upper right is called um, stink horn um, fungus, and it, it really does smell very bad. Um, and it often happens on mulches, so, and it's often very colorful. Um, and, and very kind of creepy looking, but easy to kind of just eliminate. The one on the left in the big pictures is something called artillery fungus. And this one's so cool. It's kind of amazing unless you have it. 
um, and then it's amazingly difficult to get rid of. Uh, this is a fungus that actually shoots out the spores uh, a great distance, a lot like that touch me not. And this is those how they're, those spores are kind of glued to the siding of someone's house, and it glues itself very well. It's a very difficult one uh, to get off. And finally, on the lower right is something called daughter. Um, this is a parasitic plant that kind of a vine that kind of grows over a lot of different things, kind of smothers a lot of things out and kind of attacks and um, takes a lot of the carbohydrates from the host plant that it's growing over. Um, pretty vicious, um, but not something we see very often in Iowa, fortunately. So as I'm asking you what other plants you think are naughty in your landscape, these are plants that kind of take over, might be a little bit stinky. Um, there are some other kind of tropical plants that are super naughty, um, or at least on the naughty list often. The one on the left is a strangler fig. Uh, that can kill trees in areas like in Florida and Hawaii. We'll see that one in tropical areas. And then the, the naughty plant of the year that everyone loves is the corpse flower or those voodoo lilies. Those amorphophallus that produce these amazing flowers that smell really bad because um, they're attracting um, different types of pollinators uh, to, to kind of come to them. So very bad smells from this corpse flower, which is pretty amazing. Some other things that are appearing on the list um, include uh, poison ivy, poison oak, Japanese honeysuckle. I'm showing some of you guys this list, um, as well as loose strife. Oh, the puff mu mushrooms, I think they're kind of fun. Some of those are kind of fun. Japanese honeysuckle should definitely be on the list, and so should kudzu. Very good, very good. Um, stinging nettle is another great one for this list in skunk, skunk cabbage. Good, good ideas. Oh, ginkgo fruit. I would agree. This is pretty smelly fruit. Um, it's a good one to have on the list as well. Okay. Good. You're coming up with some of the right plants, some of the right ideas. So now let's talk about those plants that have toxic secondary defenses. Secondary defenses mean that these plants have the ability to cause some sort of consequence. Um, they have a way to defend themselves. Even though it might be entirely eaten, it's going to get back at you. Uh, whether it's just a mild stomach upset, um, uh, maybe a rash, or it could be something more serious. And some of them on this list are pretty serious. With anything that we're considered poisonous, however, it often depends on the dosage, um, the amount consumed, the dosage in what part that plant is consumed, um, as well as um, your immune response um, as well. So, um, of course, young kids and older adults might be more impacted um, than others. Regardless, that's my disclaimer. This is a list of plants that we need to respect. We need to respect for what they're capable of and, and maybe even think about whether we want to include them in the landscape or not, making sure that we know, have some kind of safety measures in place, just knowing this. Um, some of these are also great medicinal plants, believe it or not. So uh, think about that. Um, so what makes it almost poisonous or toxic can also make it a medicinal property um, as well. And some of these are just fun, like ghost pepper. Um, this is one that I would consider or never consider eating because after eating just even a little piece of it, um, it took days to get that um, out of my system and out of my mouth. Here are some of them, and we'll start with that ghost pepper pepper. It's a super hot pepper. There are a lot of hot peppers and a lot of people who really love hot peppers. So find the pepper range you like on that Scoville scale um, and kind of stick with it or maybe a little bit below. But recognize that this one is, is pretty hot. 
um, and a really hard one to consume uh, unless you want to make your own little hot sauce and use one drop at a time on whatever it is. The next one uh, to the left is poison ivy. Um, there are a lot of plants in the center of this are a lot of plants that cause some uh, different types of rashes or different types of reactions. Um, poison ivy is a very common one. Everyone should know what this one looks like. Um, that three leaflet leaf that is slightly jagged or serrated, has a beautiful fall color. It's a beautiful vine in the woods, um, but really pretty um, uh, toxic. Uh, to some people who are susceptible. I'll also mention that sometimes you maybe not think that you could get poison ivy or never break out in a rash, and then I swear right after that you're going to get it. Um, so it's one of those things that you can go for many years without getting any uh, rash or response and then somehow just magically break out um, after seeing it or touching it. Um, so it is one that is a, a really good secondary defense because it has a lasting impact. The next one is wild parsnip. Um, this is uh, found in our roadsides and ditches, and it too has a kind of a toxic sap that has a phytotoxic response. So you get the sap on your legs or your ankles, and then once you expose your legs or ankles in that sap to sun, then it kind of burns or blisters uh, your skin. It's very distinctive, very painful. So something we should be aware of um, and try and avoid. And then there's also poison hemlock. This looks a lot like um, Queen Anne's lace, looks a lot like uh, the wild parsnip, but white flowers. And it has a a problem when once ingested um, and becomes very toxic and could be fatal uh, to some people. So another one to avoid and be aware of. And then I put you in here too. Um, a lot of us have used in our landscape and occasionally use will produce these bright red berries. And the, the juicy part of the berry is actually edible and birds love them. So leave them on there for the birds. But the seeds themselves can be pretty toxic um, and pretty um, poisonous and maybe cause some stomach upset. But you has been used, uh, you bark of certain uh, use, has been used for medicinal effects and actually curing uh, some cancers or alleviating some cancers. So this is one of those that has a little bit of a medicinal effect as well as having some kind of toxic effects. Here are a few others that are typically very poisonous and fun to have in our landscapes, some of them, um, but also something that we should be aware of. So make sure that um, if you're planting these, maybe if you have little kids that like to eat things or pets that like to eat things, uh, that maybe these aren't within reach um, of that. I should say that we don't run studies on poisonous plants. No one volunteers for those um, and no pet um, is actually volunteered for those studies either. So a lot of what we have is very anecdotal data and then to know what the chemistry of some of these plants are and know that that can be toxic uh, to certain people. So we don't encourage eating any plant, but these I would say definitely take them off the edible list. Um, the ones on the left are at the top is something called oleander. Um, this is a shrub in the south. Uh, it's sometimes grown as a house plant here, but it's a hard one to grow as a house plant. But you will see this one if you go to parts of the south, Texas, um, Arizona, maybe into uh, Alabama. Um, you'll see this one kind of used as a shrub in, in landscapes. Beautiful flowers, um, but highly poisonous. Below that is monkshood um, or wolfsbane. Um, this is a very toxic plant. It grows well in Iowa as a perennial in part shade, has this kind of hooded type flower, um, hence the name monk's hood, um, but uh, was used at one time to grind up the, the roots to bait and poison and kill dogs and, and wolves. And will also have uh, pretty detrimental effects to people as well. 
great cut flower, but just not one I would have in the landscape with a two-year-old. In the center is castor bean. Um, this is a beautiful annual um, that can grow really big and it's very dynamic, very tropical looking with these really spiny type seed heads. And the seed inside is super poisonous. In fact, one of the moist, most poisonous uh, plants that you can actually grow. Um, beautiful plant, one uh, that I would avoid if you have small children. Uh, the two along the top are another couple of plants that sometimes appear in home landscapes. This is foxglove, the pink one, a close-up of the flower on this one. Digitalis, the heart drug, actually comes from foxglove um, and is a fantastic perennial or biennial, excuse me, um, in your landscape, um, but uh, an interesting medicinal as well as toxic plant um, as well. And then lily of the valley. Who knew that lily of the valley, valley can be pretty toxic? The seed are bright red and very attractive to small children um, and usually pretty poisonous. So one of those things I would keep out of reach of small kids. And then the one in the bottom on the right is called Camas, death Camas or Camas. And um, it is a native in parts of, there's different ones, but this one is more of a mountainous one um, that produces a pretty toxic plant and has a, a little bulb-like root structure. And then some other plants that you might see around. Um, this is called Devil's Trumpet or Jimson Weed um, or Datura, the one on the right with the flower. Um, very um, toxic as well and hallucinogen um, that has caused the death of some people. So another one to avoid. And then the one on the left is a houseplant called dumb cane or Diffenbachia. Uh, and when it's eaten, um, will cause your throat to swell up and becomes really difficult to breathe. Um, so another one that maybe should be avoided in houses with small children. Um, yes, Liz, the, the, uh, the pods of Datura are very spiky and spiny, so they're pretty scary looking, so a good thing uh, to avoid. So what are some other uh, poisonous plants that you know of? Um, once again, as a disclaimer, sometimes it's hard to know which plants are poisonous um, because we don't run these studies, uh, but I see some a few things on here. I'm looking at moon seed, euphorbias, some euphorbias are toxic. Some remember some of these toxic responses might be a skin rash uh, to some people as well as um, maybe toxic for uh, animals or maybe toxic ingested. So hogweed, jack in the pulpit uh, seeds, lantana can be. Yeah, things if you don't know if it's edible or not, don't eat it. Don't try it. It's it's really not worth it. I I must admit. Right. We've got some other things in here too. Pope weed is also mentioned. This is a a weed that we sometimes see. Mm -hmm. Good. You guys are doing really well. On the list of things, I like it. Um, one of the things I don't see on the list, which I'm very happy not to see on the list, is something called poinsettia. Um, that's because we're coming up on poinsettia season, and it is not one of those toxic plants, believe it or not. Um, it is one of the few plants we've actually studied to see if it's toxic or poisonous, and very rarely has it caused any reaction at all. Um, I have tasted it, I have eaten it, and it, it tastes horrible, so don't try it. Um, and the only uh, toxicity usually is a skin rash for some people who are sensitive. So um, poinsettia, you can take off the list. And I don't think it's toxic to cats either. Um, I think that's another one where they've actually studied. But toxicity in people and toxicity in uh, pets, two very different things. And once again, we don't run these studies a lot, so it's hard to know. Oh, 
bark from the cashew tree. Yes, parts of the cashew tree are toxic or poisonous. Yeah, that's true. Rue can be, absolutely. Oh, yeah, crown of thorns, hogweed. You guys have got a nice long list. I appreciate it. We know something about plants. Oh, elderberry. I don't know. Elderberry, uh, the fruit's pretty tame, but um, other things can be a little less so. So we're getting close to the end of my talk, and um, I think we're at about 15 minutes till the end. This is the last toxic plant I want to show you. This is belladonna or a member of the nightshade family and super toxic. Um, I don't think we see this one, this particular one, as much in the Midwest um, as you might in the Southeast, but there are many members of the nightshade family that are fairly poisonous or toxic. So know that family well. Tomato and potato are in that family and are, are quite okay for the most part, but um, there are some that are pretty toxic um, out there. You won't find a poisonous plant list on necessarily on the Horton Home Pest news page, but on the bottom you will see uh, the list of these kind of strange and spooky plants that kind of initiated uh, this talk. Oh, so, and that's good. And I'm looking at the the chat again and Buckeye just popped up and that's another good one not to eat. So it's another good toxic one. So what questions 